there's certain things that are more complicated, I think, about sport optics than any other field. Um, the primary one being you're sticking this optic on something that's constantly exploding. It has recoil. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, uh, if you went to an optomechanics class, it's probably funny, but they'd probably go through, like, all these strategies for mounting lenses precisely and doing all this stuff. And a lot of times we're like, well, this is like assuming there's no vibration or shock. And it's like, oh, throw that all out the window. <laughs> All right, everybody, we are coming to you here with uh, one guest that who's been on before with some podcasts that you guys really enjoyed. That is Christian across the table, our optical engineer in the house, one of them in the house. And uh, so he is across the table from Mark and I, but also we are joined by a new guest. I don't know if it's your first podcast ever. Maybe. It is. It, it is. is. Todd, Todd Claremont. So welcome to the table. And uh, he is also going to share some of his uh, some of his knowledge with us. We have two engineers basically across the table from us, Mark. So we're we're not quite outnumbered, but in terms of probably in terms of knowledge, brain power, brain power, yeah, we oh, are. Yeah, we are. Uh, we're basically unarmed. Right. So we're going to do our best to uh, get the get the right answers out of these guys to make for some entertaining uh, and interesting conversation. But we want to talk about optics specifically and that probably makes sense you're probably wondering you guys have almost like 300 total episodes thus far and 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 now you're just saying we want to talk about <laughs> optics um you know jim what we ought to talk about i don't know if this ever crossed yeah. your mind optics <laughs> so that's that's what we're going to discuss we're going to discuss a little bit of like the life of an optical engineer or you know in the in the case of we'll get into todd's history because it's it's very interesting it's you're you're you work in optics you have worked in optics for a great deal of your career you're maybe not like you wouldn't call yourself like an optical engineer i know you said that earlier on but you know a lot about it yep yep, yep. and then christian you are an optical engineer so we're going to talk about that whole the lifestyle of it I, I think some people have even asked in the past like how does one even become an optical engineer or get involved in working with optics there's you know, there's all kinds of, uh, you know, you got mechanical engineers, you've got electrical, you've got industrial and uh, civil. Those are kind of like the real common ones you tend to hear. Um, not to take anything away from those because you have to be very smart to do any any kind of engineering. But uh, but optical engineering isn't really one you hear a whole lot about in just day-to-day -day life unless you work here. Um, so with uh, without further ado, let's have you guys tell us a little bit about what it's like working in optics. And also, I'm curious sort of how you got here like how you got uh to be working with optics or christian in your case the title of an optical engineer like what did you do why did you even want to do that were you a little kid one day like i'm gonna be an optical <laughs> engineer when i'm older my story is not really probably as exciting as todd's because <laughs> you kind of transitioned from you said you're electrical engineer as your degree i did my first year in college undeclared major so i was one of those people it's like i really don't know what i'm doing and one of my friends I had him, known him since kindergarten. Uh, and we went to the same high school too. So K through 12, he's like, hey, I'm at this school and we play with lasers and stuff. <laughs> you should check out this optics program. So I applied and eventually got accepted. And I was like, is this really what I want to do? My mom was just like, well, you better do something because you can't just do nothing <laughs> forever. And I was like, oh, I'll like, keep going and see if anything stops it. Then something stops it. Nothing has stopped it so far. I'm still doing optics. Yeah. A Co couple rounds of laser tag later, here he is. Yeah, pretty much. There you have it. Although... Funnily enough, you know, we don't, sports optics isn't as laser focused, although we have laser range finders and, and such, but the, yeah. the laser field, laser physics is so broad. There's so many different things. Um, if we delve deep into that later, <laughs> <laughs> and but we, yeah, I didn't even end up doing as much laser stuff. I prefer to do like the sports optics or imaging type thing where you're making an image of good quality, hopefully <laughs> right? putting it through a system and whatever. From what I've gathered, when you go to school for optical engineering, generally speaking, there's not like at least a significant portion or even like a, a degree within that in sport optic type stuff, right? Yeah, you kind of said you, you sort of go for something a little bit more broad than you have to apply it to your particular field. Because sport optics are kind of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they're kind of unique from vast like the bulk of optical engineering out there right isn't a lot of it just around lasers and sensors and all that stuff that we have in everyday life that we probably don't even realize we're using pretty much yeah i have a list here of the million things not not exhaustive but if we get to it i can list off sort of the the main things that happen with light and then where that branches off to 
you kind of get, you know, all the branches and eventually, yeah, like you said, sport optics is way down there. Hit us up with the yeah. list. I'm curious. Right. Well, for like the, the academic side, there's, I guess, three ways that you describe light and its interaction with matter. It's like the scientific way to say it. How does it interact with stuff? And then how do you control it? Uh, a lot of what sport optics is would be geometrical optics, hmm. which is modeling light as a ray. You've probably heard ray of light. That's where that comes from. And it's geometrical, so you know you kind of pretend everything's kind of moving in straight lines like a triangle. You can use a triangle. Uh, so like calculating field of view at 100 yards, and there's whatever width you're seeing, however many feet at 100 yards, you use a triangle and determine the field of view. That's a geometrical equation. Okay. It's simplified, but it works. It's really accurate for simple stuff. Um, and then the, the two things that happen with that, uh, with geometrical optics is refraction and reflection, which uh, you guys probably know reflection cause you look in a mirror, you know, what mm-hmm. reflection, what reflection does, but refractions one people know less about, which is light bending as it goes through glass. So you have the air glass interface and it bends, uh, and that's how the rifle scope works. It's just all mm-hmm. glass lenses, really any sport optic, as long as it's the, the visible, visible component, it's, um, light just bending through glass. And you're using refraction to your advantage. It's not like yeah. some people might hear, oh, you're bending, like the light hits it and it bends. That could be conceived as negative almost. But you're actually using the refraction to your advantage. Yeah. And actually you're trying to avoid reflection, right? Yeah. Dep- yeah. Dep- all depends what you're oh, doing. Cause you just, yeah. If like for a laser range finder, I'm sure you get the laser back, you want to reflect it back into a detector. Oh, yeah. But for a rifle scope, yeah, you don't want any stray reflections. You just want the light coming through. Um, so yeah, it just, (laughs) everything, (laughs) it all, it all depends. Everyone makes fun of me for saying it depends all the time, but (laughs) it does all depend. Man, Um, you'd have done great in, uh, in in the economics degree that I took because every question (laughs) I ever asked a teacher was just depends. No, depends on the situation. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, can I just take a test and just write it depends in every blank? (laughs) Anyway. So the, the next section, which is still relevant is physical optics. So that's light as a wave. So you've probably heard the term light waves. So that's sort of where that comes from. And the physics or math behind it is using the wave equation, which I won't get into the math. <laughs> I don't even know if I remember it that well, but the things that come from that are interference of waves. So I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, actually the easy one would be like ocean waves yeah. or like water waves. You see them come together, make a twice oh. as big wave and then keep going. That would be wave interference. But that principle applies also to light. So there's situations where that happens. Um, Another common thing you might have seen is... Like light actually bumping into each other. Is that what you're describing? Yep. And Uh, then making super light or or, (laughs) Super light, constructive or destructive. Constructive or destructive interference. So if you see uh, like a puddle of water, it just rained and your your car leaked a little bit of oil onto it, that interface between the oil and the water, light will hit that and kind of make an interference pattern and you can see construction... Constru- constructive and destructive interference. Hmm. Um, and you can, so that's where the optical What would be the constructive part and then the destructive part of that then? Uh, I'd have to look at a picture. Okay. Maybe I should pull it up. Of like? Uh, interference Well, pattern. just like, you know, just the, um, like the oil, whatever. Got a lot of oil that you're leaking onto your truck there, Mark? No. It's probably a good time to <laughs> go through and actually sell it Yeah, maybe you've never then. seen it's it a Ford, you- It's a Ford F-150, Jim. They don't have problems. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Your truck's too good. Well, I should have brought a picture Christian of that. We'll have to post Christian one. Christian knows optics and later. Yeah, I'll have to post one. Uh, a better example, that's like the common example they introduced in class, but a better example is like the optical coatings we use on the lenses. Mm-hmm. So you have the, the glass, and then you put like a small layer of material on top of that. And the difference between the refractive index, so that goes back to refraction, between that small new material you put and the glass will cause constructive and destructive interference based on the wavelength of the light. Okay. So the anti-reflective coating is using that to your advantage. You you make a coating on the lens such that the the visible wavelengths uh, be destructive interference. You don't want any reflecting back. So whatever light hits that surface and comes back um, destructively interferes with uh, where it's reflecting on the top material and off the glass. That difference in length, physical length, makes it destructively interfere. That's probably <laughs> pretty technical. Wow. But Are you happy, Mark? And, <laughs> That's your answer. And then the ultimate result is? Uh, light is not coming back anymore. Okay. Yeah, so because it got destroyed. 
<laughs> oh dear! Wow, that sounds sad. <laughs> yeah, destructively interfered. That's so pretty it, cool. yeah, interference is a weird one, but it's so like the optical coatings is a big one where that's that's how it gets built up, I guess, from that phenomena. Right. Um, and then after that, there's diffraction, which maybe you've heard of, maybe not. Light. I have heard of. I've heard the word. Yeah, that's light bending around corners. Um, um, yeah, so that one's weird. It's not refraction where it's just it's supposed to be bending like in the center of a lens. It's at the edge of the lens. Whenever there's an edge, there's diffraction. Um, and that's mm-hmm. one of the things that limits optical systems. You can't get better than um, what the diffraction is doing because it's always there. If you could make an infinitely big lens, then you wouldn't have any, but obviously that wouldn't be very realistic. But mm-hmm. um, And then polarization. So... It's like the direction, you've heard that with sunglasses, but it's the direction that the electric and magnetic field are going. You've probably heard like light is electromagnetic um, energy. Uh, so polarization has to do with the direction those fields are traveling. It gets all weird. Wow. <laughs> I actually hadn't heard of it as electromagnetic energy, but it sounds, sounds sweet. Yeah, or electromagnetic radiation. So um, skipping maybe a little bit into like some of the applications, but like radio waves... You don't think of as light, but it's oh, the yeah. same type of energy. It's just a wavelength that you don't necessarily see. Oh, Todd, right, here, here we go. Todd, Todd has, has a diagram. Our, exactly. Yeah. So th- this is the electromagnetic spectrum, and what we're talking about is you know, the shorter wavelengths of light, longer wavelengths of light, and everybody's familiar with the visible because those are what we see, right? Sure. So the colors, and then what I was working on is infrared, which is a little longer wavelength, slightly below. Infrared's like when you stare at the sun, the orange. That's kind of what generates infrared energy. But, yeah, this is the electromagnetic spectrum. No, don't stare, stare at the sun. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But that gives a good idea of, you know, a lot of techniques optically use the electromagnetic spectrum, and it's just how they use them. But the principles to the optics behind it are pretty similar. Yeah. Okay. Nice. And the, now that I'm looking at the, this actually is helping me remember. I think the oil and water pattern, part of it is it's mostly certain colors are getting through because... Yeah, if I could draw it out, it makes more sense. That's but really handy marker placement there, MC Ryan. Nice, nice work. Yeah, we're drawing a handy. diagram. Just make this the oil, and this is the water. Um, so it has to do with light that goes here, bounces out here. There's light that goes here and comes all the way here, and this distance and this whole distance are different. Um, and then there's also light that just bounces off here. So some so light makes it through the oil, but not through the water. Some makes it through the oil and the water and bounces back, and some just bounces off the oil. Yeah. And then that's where you're getting the kind of like so gradient, certain the rainbow colors. Based on the whatever these distances are, certain wavelengths of light will make it so that uh, the waves line up so that it's constructive interference and you see the color versus destructive interference and you don't see the color. Does that sound right, Todd? Yeah. Yep. This yeah. is actually more like in a Todd's realm of... Because he goes into spectroscopy, which we'll get into, is all, you know, the spectrum of light and right. certain materials and their behaviors with light and how to identify them. Yeah, and and that's impacted by the density of the material and the angle of the way the optics. There's yeah. a lot of things that impact that, and that's why you really want to be uh, careful. You understand what's going on with that because you don't want the destructive part coming back, so you can yep. mess yeah. up your optics and your visuals. Right. Right. What do we go into Todd's thing next? Is that the natural next progression, or do you have? Is there's one more field? There's one more. We'll let's, quickly go let's, over. Let's hear it. Um, this one I don't do the most in, but it's quantum optics or describing light as a photon. You've probably heard photon of light. Okay. And it's more light as a particle and modeling it in that way. And in certain situations, it acts more like a particle. Um, a lot of that goes into lasers, and one photon of light has a certain amount of energy. It hits an atom, excites its electron. Um, the electron can lose all that energy and then emit another photon. Um, there's a whole field using that to make and design lasers. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the other one. And what, then. How is light all these? How is light a wave, <laughs> a photon, like a, a, a particle? And it's. How is it all the things? Uh, I don't know. It just is. <laughs> is that something <laughs> that even when you go to optical engineering school, they they don't real like you still don't even know when you leave. You're just kind of like, hey, there's this thing. We kind of know how to play with it, but we still don't really even understand like how it is what it is. Yeah, sort of. And it the way to think about it, or at least the way I think about it, is that 
uh, it sort of doesn't matter. Like it's not any one of those things. It's just the math helps to describe, like every time you use that math, it ends up being consistent and working out the same way. So okay. why not use it to control it? <laughs> I guess, yeah, makes sense. But it's not, yeah, not necessarily any of those things. I mean, I guess the best description of it is just the electromagnetic radiation. That's hmm. the, like the literal thing that it is, but there's all this different behavior that um, there's, I guess there's different phenomena in physics that you could describe as a wave and a particle, but light kind of just hits everything in different situations. Man. And that's where like you get into all these fields. There's all these different like refraction, refraction, reflection, interference, diffraction, uh, polarization, emission with photons and also absorption. And then uh, that branches off into like a million different things that you can do using those properties. So crazy. It gets crazy. wild. And so spectroscopy is what uh, we were describing before. Just one of those. But just one of those. <laughs> <laughs> but that does use a lot of them. So Todd will get into it. But a spectrometer, you know, you have to guide the light around. You're going to use some geometrical optics. Um, and then there's absorption uh, into the sample. Um, and s- sometimes you're using interference. Interference, okay. refraction, yep. So you, you hit everything, but you're kind of taking these bits and pieces and using it. So, so yeah. Todd, tell us about tell us about what you've done and how you got here as well, because I think you know you've got an interesting story. Christian, at, at this point in time, when he when he came up, he was able to go to a school that had this sort of thing. Now you sort of learned it on the fly in mm-hmm. in the moment, and uh, it's it's fascinating. I think. Yeah, I mean, um, what's interesting is a lot of the optical principles are pretty old, 19th century, 18th century. And in an infrared spectrometer is something called the Michelson interferometer. And that was actually developed in the late 19th century by Albert Michelson. Hmm. So in theory, there was a lot of things that they thought they could do with this. But it wasn't until they had the computing power where they could make optical techniques with the computing power to actually do things with this, right? So about the late 70s or early 80s, when mainframe computers started to get miniaturized, there was an explosion in the industry of just these scientific techniques that now were available to, to, to happen. And I was just one of those lucky guys that was at the right place at the right time. And uh, there was a company here in Madison called Nicolet. And I was lucky to be one of the, you know, one of the early guys into that industry and, um, you know, kind of did everything at that day. It was a small company. It was exploding. So from, you know, building the instruments to going out with them, training PhD customers on it and doing the applications, kind of soup to nuts, right? You'd, you'd, go, yeah. out with, you'd go out with your oscilloscope and your bag of Radio Shack parts, and you'd end up teaching somebody how to do forensic science with their spectrometer. So Jeez. interesting time to be alive. And so you, and that's what Nicolay specialized in was spectrometers yep. then? In particular, we did infrared spectroscopy, sometimes called vibrational spectroscopy. And to, to give you an idea, I got a, a fun example. Oh, man. Um, so this is what it produces. It's called an absorbent spectra. And to you guys, this looks like squiggly lines, right? Mm-hmm. But, yep. think, but think of it as a fingerprint, right? And anything that has carbon or is organic can be measured by infrared. So if you think about something as, as, as small as water, simple as water, right? So water, I've got basically two molecules, H2O, right? Hydrogen and two oxygen. Well, in their natural state, the molecules vibrate. Right. Okay. And the reason it's called vibrational spectroscopy is I may be, my two hydrogens may be vibrating like this, and the infrared frequency that matches this vibration actually gets absorbed by the sample and creates a peak. Right. So for H2O, I might have this kind of vibration at 1600 wave numbers, or I might have this kind of vibration at 3800 wave numbers. Right. Yeah. So those different things get absorbed. So what you end up with is this is a fingerprint of atmosphere or your breath, right? This is something that we would not want in our microscopes, right? This is something we would kind of try to evacuate out, water and CO2. And this is actually a a definite spectra. There's no other fingerprint like this one. So water, carbon dioxide. Now, if um, you had a martini for lunch and you breathed into this, you'd see a nice big OH for the alcohol, but it's a great way to kind of measure measure organic materials. And that's kind of how it works. Whoa. And um, how that works is it's a lot of the same optical principles that we use. So instead of your visible light, right, you have infrared light. Instead of visible light, um, we use mirrors to get this into what's called a Michelson interferometer. It's just a fancy word for a fixed mirror 
a moving mirror, and a beam splitter, right? Hmm. And that you can call this constructive and destructive, but actually what it does is modulate the signal. And then uh, that goes and it's focused. Where we would focus to a reticle, this focuses to a sample. So that's where you put your sample in. And then focuses to a detector, which in, in the rifle scope would be the eye. So the, the concepts are all the same, right? Wow. And um, it was that coupling with the computer because what this interferometer did is, you know, this is a, a, a time domain spectrum, our frequency domain spectrum. This actually modulates it. We, we have a laser that we just track the speed and movement of the moving mirror. And this actually turns it into a time domain spectra. And then you got to use something called a Fourier transform, which is just math to get it back into the frequency domain. And that actually just produces this. So it was the advent of mating this with a computer that um, allowed you to do that. And this is what an actual instrument would look like, our example of an instrument. So here's the uh, infrared source, right? And it's just using optics to collimating it into an interferometer. And then that comes out of the interferometer and then gets focused as to the sample, then gets focused to the detector. And this is just a Heaney laser, 16384. And what this does is it gets modulated and it allows the electronics to keep track of how fast that moving mirror is moving and how far it's moving. So that it just modulates to create that time domain spectrum at the right point. Wow, I feel like if for everybody listening out there who doesn't get the chance to watch this, and we'll try and pop some pictures up if you're watching on YouTube, but uh, it's almost... it. it, it Reminds me of setting up a table of a game of mousetrap, but a little bit bigger, and you have just yeah. this laser that starts out, and a bunch of mirrors set up around to bounce the laser around and have it go through stuff, and man. What's what's really cool about this is that for operation, you know, if you think of anything organic, we could grab this, cut it into a sample and get a spectrum. This is polydiene or polystyrene or some polymer, and it would actually give you the spectra, so it allowed anybody who made products to actually analyze the formulation or test the quality of their product. So this is pretty much used almost everywhere. So if you think about anything, you know, food, beverage, uh, pharmaceuticals, um, forensics. Gas um, and oil. Gas and oil. Um, um, yeah, um, it's wow. it's pretty universal technique for doing all this thing. So what was nice is, you know, as somebody who's, who made these, we got to go out and have our hands kind of helping people develop this stuff. So you get and, to see like all kinds of industries. Yeah, and so they they you know they don't look that. Um, Looks like a PlayStation One yeah. with a microscope attached. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like a video. So game they're system. not that intimidating, right? I mean, you just put a sample in, and you get a, a, a answer out. I mean, what you were describing sounds like it would take up a room. You know, like yeah, it was interesting because um, as technology progressed, the the first ones would probably take up way more than this table. Oh, and sure. they, were, they were huge, but now um, they're the size of this cube. I mean, they're even portable now because things have just been able to shrink and yeah. um, do that. I mean, essentially, what it's doing, it's telling you all the things that are in the thing. Like, it's breaking down. Like, like oh, you could be like, oh, this looks like plastic. But there might be, like, multiple yeah. polymers that are making up yeah. this. And so you're like, oh, no, you've got A, B, C, D, E, and it's all making the final. Well, yeah, because, so, like, you know, pa food packaging people think is pretty simple, but it's not. Like a ketchup bottle is 20 layers of plastic with adhesive layers, and they do that, you know, so that the sunlight doesn't get in to contaminate the food. You know, the food doesn't eke out to, like, you know, stink up the aisle. So packaging is actually very specific. And so. So they're actually banking on some reflection there. Um, sometimes total blockage, sometimes reflection, depending on what properties they're trying to get. Yeah. Okay. Sure enough. So, so packaging is, is very complex. And um, that's, you know, you said the infrared microscope, some of that was used to how do you see small things? Because these layers can be, you know, a human hair is about 10 microns. So these packaging layers can be 10 to 50 microns in, in thickness. And so obviously you need a way to see that. So that led to this, which is basically an accessory. And again, the same concept, it just mirrors collimating, except now we use an objective to focus to a small point. And then a condenser to collect it, right? And then uh, focus it onto a detector. So same principles that you use in a rifle scope. Um, yeah. But just using infrared energy and diff the, rather than the eye, a different detector. And rather than visible light, it's infrared light. Hmm. And I love the I love the part, too, that you went into just as we were kind of talking before podcasting. It's just like everybody was on the same playing field, it seemed, at, about, at that time approximately just because... Computers were coming on scene, and so everybody was now just finally 
getting to start figuring things out more. And that's where you jumped in. And you were even mentioning, of course, we're in the late 70s, early 80s, so everybody's smoking cigarettes like it's going out of style. And you, that's how they check the lasers and stuff, well, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> early alignment when you... Very scientific. So you got to remember, right, there weren't the CAD programs and things, so that optics were very much um, a work of art. So when you would put a spectrometer together, there would be the Heaney laser that you could use to kind of tune in all your op- optics. But then occasionally, you know, you could do some tricks. And one of the tricks was people would, you know, take their cigarette smoke and blow to see the optical path. (laughs) Um, I know that's not politically correct anymore, but it was done quite a bit back in the day because it was one of the ways to um, check your alignment of optics. Sure enough. Yeah. Man, that's super cool. And so and so that path, you kind kind of led you. In that case, it's not so, uh, what am I trying to say? It's not so unheard of or whatever that you wound up in sporting optics. Because like you said, I mean, everything that you were showing there from when I've seen, you know, diagrams of a rifle scope, granted, I don't always know why it is the way it is, but I mean, what you're showing there looks a lot like a rifle scope just all disassembled and put in different ways with some mirrors in there to bounce the, the light around. Yeah, you have to worry about the same things, right? You can't have stray light. You can't have it focusing too soon or too late. You can't have a uh, light reflecting off a coating surface that you don't want it to. You know, it's all about managing the most amount of light back to the detector. Yeah. And then with 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 infrared, what happened is, um, you know, once people found out they could do this, they started applying it to everything. And then it became more of, well, you know, I just can't always stick my sample in there. How can I do something really simple? So, like, if I wanted to measure the plastic water bottle, but I didn't want to take it apart, um, we started experimenting with other optical techniques. So there used to be something called ATR, which Christian was explaining is where that's where you're actually using a crystal, which sits down here, and you're actually passing the infrared light, and it actually reflects through the crystal. Okay. Right? And so what happens is when you put the sample on the crystal, there's there's a coupled wave called an evidescent wave that actually goes in and actually interacts with the sample, but you can simply touch it, and you get a spectra. And that became really cool because you could pour, like, from a caterpillar, right? Big big caterpillar with lots of oil. You don't want to be changing it all the time. You could pour the oil into this ATR, and it would give you an expect spectra of the oil. And you could determine, you know, how much soot, how much ethylene glycol. You know, basically, when should I change these 50-gallon oil or however much they use? Oh, wow. So it, it kind of applied to everything. But the more applications we ran into, the more optical techniques we got into. Wow. Another one was, um, you know, like pharmaceuticals, everybody wants to know what's in the pharmaceutical, obviously, how much of the active ingredient. And so a lot of that's uh, powders, and powders can be particularly difficult because the way, like, you know, if I shine light through this, the optical properties are pretty well understood. I, I know I've got a refractive index, but I know how to deal with it. When you got particles, because they're all different sizes, uh, the light just kind of bounces around. Sure. And you really can't control it. So then we used optics where we basically took what would be considered an objective lens. And we basically collected all the infrared energy that came off the powder and just redirected it to a detector. So then you could actually, you know, measure powders without doing anything to it. So you could just pour powder in a cup, you know, put it in the instrument and you get a spectra. So, but it's all done by optics, right? Our our versions of optics. So that's why it's called, you know, spectroscopy. It's mostly optics. I'm, I'm convinced there's literally nothing on the earth that that wouldn't apply to. Inorganics doesn't work too well on. Um, so mostly any, you know, most mostly type carbon type type compounds. What would what would inorganic be? Because I mean, you're mentioning metals, polymers, plastics. Yeah, metals. Okay. You know, things like that. Um, but yeah, polymers, plastics, everything else, any anything that contains carbon, it pretty good. Hmm. Amazing. Paints, adhesives, pretty much anything. The wow. other crazy thing is like a lot of these ideas from what I gather from what you said earlier, like super old. And then all of a sudden we had computers and the horsepower to be like, we know this is the case, but we don't have the horsepower to do it. And then that stuff met. And yeah, a lot of, a lot of it was theory. Right. And it wasn't until the computing power came along where you could kind of test that theory. And then, you know, somebody was sitting there testing there and going, Ooh, make some money doing this. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know, but actually it was able to prove out the theories and actually, um, so there was a, whole host of instrumentation that that happened as part of the miniaturization of the pc and the computer sure so todd you've gotten the chance to actually and christian you have a little bit of stuff that you did prior to vortex right that was different than sporting optics if i'm not mistaken i actually have a connection to todd i was actually uh 
So out of college, I worked with cameras and I was more of like a sales engineer was in my title. And then I did kind of more manufacturing, but I was at a company called Pike Technologies and they make accessories for spectrometers. Oh. Um, they're also in Madison. So Todd and I kind of have that connection. So I started to get into this field, not as much on the engineering side necessarily, but a lot on the manufacturing side. Um, so yeah, I've dealt with those objectives and the condenser, which is what's illuminating the sample, right? Um, yeah, and kind of got into that field that way. It was pretty interesting. And then from there I came here and then now it's still do manufacturing stuff, but more design than, than anything. Yeah. I think that's what they say, Jim. It's like the six, six degrees of spectrometers. Oh yeah. Ties, right. Ties people together. Exactly. Kind of like, uh, Kevin Bacon and yep. degrees of separation. Yep. Um, so both of you guys have kind of been able to do some different things with optics in your career. Is there anything that you would say, like, if somebody were to want to pursue a career in optics or or learn more about it to try and get a job that, that was involved with optics, is there, like, oh, once you start going down one certain path, you're sort of uh, alienating yourself from other potential paths you could have gone in optics, where, like, do you feel as though you guys know a lot about sporting optics and also spectrometers and stuff like that? But are there other fields in optics where you're like, I'm so far down this rabbit hole of sport optics and and these kind of things that there's there's guys and gals doing optics stuff in, in another realm that I wouldn't even know how to start in? Or does it all kind of, you know, you brought up these different principles and stuff within optics. Is it all kind of like, yeah, I'm a sport optics guy, but I could go over and work on lasers, you know, and figure it out pretty quick or work on something else, sensors, and figure that out pretty quick. Uh, I think you could transition pretty easily, but you know, as long as you're, you have the right mind where you can apply the things you learned somewhere else, like Todd was saying, um, you're going to have different considerations for a different field. Uh, like if we went back to spectrometers, we'd have to think about completely different things, but we could apply all the same principles as long as you had an open mind, I guess pretty quick might be, (laughs) I don't know how long it's going to be. Not like you're going to go pick it up It's like anything. Yeah. You'd have to, you know, get trained in it. And you could think of it like mechanical engineers, it's a little easier to understand because mechanics are more visual and interactable. Uh, like if you went from the automotive field to um, something else, like you you know some of the same principles, you still be able to do good work, but it might it might be some learning curve at the beginning. Sure. Uh, yeah, I guess that's my answer. Yeah, I, th- I think a solid background in physics and um, optics and... That helps. I mean, you know, I think what tends to happen is as people graduate, they migrate to a a field that makes them more specialized. So like when you get into something like infrared spectroscopy, you just become more and more specialized because there's just more and more things that you do. But I think in general, you know, it, it applies just differently. But I think that's how optics careers are done is that people get to a point where they're kind of a specialist in their area hmm. and then they tend to stay in that area, which is unfortunate, but I think that's yeah. kind of what happens. Yeah. I think that probably happens in a lot of different career paths is, I mean, once you get really good at something and now you're at, like he said, getting more and more specialized, you're at the top of the field do, pushing the boundaries. You kind of like doing that. But Todd's an example, like he worked in spectroscopy for so long and now he's doing sport optics and he's doing fine. I think. Yeah. It seemed to have <laughs> fixed pretty it up good pretty job. quick. Yeah. Um, what do you, uh, what do you guys think in terms of like, oh, uh, I don't know. I don't want to say like difficulty scale, but complexity wise, where do sport optics fall in the lineup of things that are optical and that, you know, an optical engineer or somebody really well versed in optics might be doing, where, where do sport optics fall in, in terms of complexity overall? Like, is there, uh, a bunch of stuff that's way more complex than this, or is it actually pretty far up there and- there's certain things that are more complicated, I think, about sport optics than any other field. Um, the primary one being you're sticking this optic on something that's constantly exploding. It has recoil. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, uh, if you went to an optomechanics class, it's probably funny, but they'd probably go through, like, all these strategies for mounting lenses precisely and doing all this stuff. And a lot of times they're like, well, this is, like, assuming there's no vibration or shock. And it's like, oh, throw that all out the window. <laughs> right. And you said right. Um, well, yeah, people are like, so how many meters is that waterproof to? You know, you're like, well, I, I don't know. I'm, it's my microscope. I didn't plan on sinking it or I don't you know. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right, right. A little easier condition. So that's one that's harder. Um, I think a lot of optics, once you get into them, they can be pretty intuitive. But uh, like if you're talking about laser physics, there's a certain complexity that I guess maybe is a little 
harder than sport optics, certain things about that, um, or even spectroscopy, like Todd describing this, you get really high into detail of certain things. You just have to know so much and have built so much knowledge over so many years. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess that's any field like sport optics. We're trying to push things to be the best. So it's, it's always going to be like that, but yeah, I feel like there, there's some things that are harder, some that are easier. Well, end user thing to use it. And, uh, yeah, no, that's a good point. Cause like for spectroscopy, you build the thing. You're like, you put your sample on here. It is what it is. It doesn't really matter what you think about it. Like <laughs> exactly. this is, this is the fingerprint of the, the atmosphere. If that was what you're measure, measuring, uh, whereas sport optics, yeah, you really have to be engaged with the customer and do so much more study, um, with the customer and yeah, figuring out exactly how to connect the physics and what they want. And yeah, that is a difficulty for sure. Yeah. Can I, ask fun, a, but. can I ask a question about the atmosphere thing we were talking about earlier? Mm -hmm. So does temperature matter? Is that a dumb question? Like you're talking about like, oh, this is, you know, H2O, right? Water. But then like as heat is applied or whatever, like it changes form. So would its signature change over temperature? Temperature, temperature matters and it can cause changes. So temperature is one of those variables that, or at least in spectroscopy, that you try to control. Okay. Yeah. So temperature can have an impact, especially depending on how far and how extreme the temperature gets, right? Mm -hmm. It has an impact in uh, sporting optics too. Because it can create mirage and it can do oh, all yeah. kinds of goofy yeah. stuff with the uh, with the light or with the yeah just the atmosphere that you're looking through. But the challenge, and I think what's common is that the eye is still a detector, yeah. right? And it's how good that you can get the light focused onto the eye, and um, that's a lot of the work that Christian does, and that's what you really focus on in optics is how can I ensure that my optical system is collecting as most efficiently the light. And how is it most effectively getting it to the eye without losses, without, you know, artifacts, without anything? And I think if you've got a good optical design, um, you can really minimize the impact of variability from eye to eye or person to person or, you know, the subjectiveness that we all have to deal with where it's just, you know, different detectors are going up to the scope each time. And, um, you know, sometimes we don't know where that eye is going to be. <laughs> Yeah, and how schooled they are in using it. So there's more challenges definitely than, you know, something that's fixed that you could say, don't move. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or even how they'll perceive it too. Cause I know sometimes, you know, I mean, there's cases all over the internet of people who are like, this scope's the greatest scope in the world. And then somebody else comes along and you're like, I sold mine because it sucked. And it just, there's no rhyme or reason. It's just whatever this person perceived it is really great. And this person perceived it as their expectations weren't bad or something. Who knows what? So that's all pretty, uh, Difficult stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and the other thing Christian mentioned that was very good, you know, we have to worry about recoil and movement, and we got a big lesson in that because most of our stuff, you know, in the spectrometry days was fixed on a bench. And then when 9-11 happened, everybody wanted to miniaturize and take these out to the field to look for, you know, traces of bombs, you know, what the forensics were and, and the sites. So we thought, well, sure, we'll just shrink this down, and, you know, we'd send the instrument, and the mirrors would fall off. And, oh. oh, no. <laughs> and it was a huge learning curve just to think about simple stuff, like, you know, putting it in a in a, in a a case that's all cushioned, and it still wouldn't arrive on site with all its pieces in place. So, you know, that, that whole subjective of, well, how do you deal with optics that actually move and have shock, that's really, that's tough, that's difficult. Yeah. And, and to make sure that they maintain alignment or... Usually what you want is that there's some mechanism where they can be misaligned, but they realign themselves, right? Just something that keeps them. So you can use different oh. ways of mounting optics, right, so that they can take certain things. And we had to go through all of that because yeah. we thought, oh, this will be a piece of cake. And I think I think almost 20 years later, they forgot their first real usable portable type of wow. system. Man. Now, is that, when you're talking about that sort of thing, because I, I can see how that would be difficult, is that on the optical engineer to try and make that system work uh, in terms of shock resistance and all that stuff? Or is that where the optical engineers and the, and the mechanical engineers start bumping heads? Or is that just a mechanical engineer thing and you guys hope that you can make an optical system to work within it? Like, where, how does that fall? Uh, usually... Uh, the optical design is just done first, and I mean, it's just always a back and forth. So, you know, you can make changes based on limitations in the mechanics, um, and the mechanics might have to be challenged for limitations, limitations in the optics. Um, that's a good question, though. Uh, there's definitely things you can do for, like, ruggedizing it optically, I guess, 
if you have too thin of a lens, like that's going to make it more susceptible to hmm. being damaged. Sense. But um, usually if you're in that thin of levels, it, it's less manufacturable anyway. So, yeah, yeah, I don't think there's too much that you can do, um, I guess, without getting into too much of the details of making it tougher necessarily. I think it is mostly on the mechanics. Um, but, I mean, there are like glass type considerations and thickness considerations and stuff like that. Okay. Sure. Yeah, but ultimately you're kind of like, it's, you give them an optical design. You're like, this is going to work. And they're like, well, we need it to do, <laughs> we need it to be this way. And then you're like, well, can we, and it's a little bit more back and forth. Christian's like the, op- the optics are perfect. Make them stay put. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's pretty much what I say. And it it is sometimes that like that where it's like, I, you know, if you give me an estimate, of some of these things let's like have a discussion on the variables that matter and then i will work around it as best as i can um like that'll happen but where the mechanical design might not be done but we can we can work through some of those first steps and make some educated guesses to save ourselves some headaches down the road sure it usually works just yeah. you know constant communication back and forth making sure we both know each other's struggles and problems to help each other out if we can but so you do have to uh you do have to get along with the mechanical engineers. Then. I do. Yeah. So uh, I'm forced, I'm forced our... to. My boss says you better get along with us. <laughs> right. So on our first podcast, when you said that they don't know anything about optics, that probably was there a little bit of repairing to do after that, or <laughs> some of them, with, yeah. with your relationships. <laughs> well, they've, they've learned since then. They, they're starting to learn some optics. So now I can't say it anymore. But uh, yeah, they got uh, wise. But I'm all you know. I've learned some mechanics too, um, and yeah, it's good to know both sides. Obviously. Don't want to be the Absolutely. expert doing CAD because, like, that's not what I enjoy. But uh, I like knowing a little bit of stuff so I can be like, okay, you know, I did this thing and um, I, knew, I did it for you just to make you happy. So <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Um, well, well I, I think there's an element of trial and error too. I mean, you, you oh, partnership yeah. as best you can, but there's just some things that you don't know until you start testing. Yeah. And, um, you know, sometimes it's just trial and error and you, you know, you think coatings work and they don't work right. You think an optical lens shape works and it doesn't work right. Or, you know, you think you've designed the perfect mount and it doesn't quite react with the material right. So it's a lot of it still, I think it's fair yeah, to just say, prototyping. just trial and error. You know, sometimes you you try some really good ideas and hopefully it yeah, fixes your problem and sometimes it doesn't. And there's no, like, that's one thing, actually, just going back to what he said. So telescopes have existed for a very long time. The application into rifles obviously kind of goes along with rifle technology. Um, but as computing started, the just lens design in general got better. Okay. Um, and so, like, rifle scopes, as a result, improve over time. Um, and it, it's kind of this, the same concept, I guess. Um, but, yeah, when you prototype, one interesting thing is now our computing power is so good, you kind of have to decide, you know, how much time do I want to spend using the computer and modeling things to the nth degree versus, you know, I'm just going to have to put this together because you can only model so much stuff. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, like, for example, um, I guess like you model the lens design, you do your optical design, none of the mechanics are necessarily there. Um, so I can't model all the mechanics really at all until uh, the computer-aided design is done in SolidWorks or something. And even that, like if... If you could just, no one would do any prototyping if you could model like how everything moves and how everything interacts. But once you put yeah. it together, you see all these interactions and you're like, throw everything out the window, we're starting over. No, <laughs> no not really that. But you'll see little things and you'll learn and apply it to the next project. And um, yeah, it gets kind of crazy. It's always a trade off like, how much time and money do I want to spend just up front trying to figure everything out as much as I can versus just make the thing and it might cost more and take some time. But you'll learn more doing that sometimes. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it gets crazy. Now, now these days, like, Todd, you, well, you're working on projects that we can't exactly talk about on the podcast, but but uh, they they revolve around a number of different things. Christian, you're obviously designing optical systems and stuff. So, But a typical day in your life, like when you come into the office, are you spending more time, like, are you just, are you usually on the computer designing stuff or are you usually modeling stuff? Is it kind of 50 50 split or is there other stuff that you sort of do in your sport optics, daily optical engineer life? Yeah. Uh, definitely not every day designing. Uh, when you 
you know, decide to work on a project and do a design, it can take a long time, but you have to be really focused on it, or at least that's how I work. I guess some people might go back and forth. I wouldn't be able to do that. I like to be focused on it, get it to where it's done. And then, um, like a prototyping stage is like kind of the next thing it, it kind of flows and you might have multiple projects where you're doing things, but, um, it kind of goes like a slow wave, uh, where you do a lot of design work and then you do a lot of prototyping and learning. Um, and then uh, also just helping other people with their projects and consulting and making sure everything's running smoothly optically. Yeah. Um, yeah, day to day, that's probably just, yeah, either designing or testing. A lot of times I'm modeling things just to learn stuff, not necessarily a full on design, but you know, I want to match reality with the model and understand how things are working. So oh. that might take a, a couple of days or something, depending on how complicated it is. So like sometimes maybe you're not going to put together an entire rifle scope optical system, model it, and then be like, oh, you'll just maybe put together like the front half of it or the, or like certain parts of it to get an idea there or do. Yeah. Depending on what the question, yeah. If it's like, if I just want to look at the objective of something okay, yeah. or just the eyepiece of something, you know, you could model just one part of it and just build that out and answer whatever the question is. But it doesn't even have to be a design related question. It could be, Hey, like what would happen if, I don't know if a mechanical person said this, Hey, can you make this lens half the thickness or something? So we have room just making something up and I'll have to go look and see what the effect of that is. Oh, is that okay. possible? Yeah. So that might be like a quick one or two day thing but it's not a full-on design or anything, but just little questions like that. Yeah. So, Like, let's say you had to make, so you're like, oh, I want to make this thinner. Would you do that by just reducing material? Would you do that by changing the material, the glass composition? I hope they wouldn't ask me that actual question because that'd be annoying to deal with. Okay, uh, no, so that's not a real question then. Uh, it can be. Let's uh, deal in reality I would here. find a, a different way to solve the problem probably than changing the thickness, depending on what, you know, Again, it all depends. Like, I'll, I'll be open-minded and I'll do whatever is necessary and I'll try and do the easiest thing. And You just respond it, and say, have, it you, might be... have you tried better mechanical engineering? <laughs> well, I was, I was surprised you weren't going to go all of the above, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you... All the, you could do all of those yes. things, yeah. Okay. Uh, like, you could, again, this is just me throwing it out there, but you could reduce the thickness and you see that all it does is defocus it, but it doesn't change any of the other aberrations. That's kind of some buzzwords, but then... You just need to refocus the system, and you're done. It was easy. All you had to do is just change the thickness. That's not necessarily always the case, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it could be that you do that, and you're like, well, now the color is not corrected, but everything else was fine. Now I have to change the glass type, or now I have to change the curvatures. And then when you get to like changing a lens, that's a lot more work intensive, especially like because now you have to qualify and prototype that. That could cause another issue that you don't foresee, so... So let me just get this straight. Okay, so if you just change one lens, you've basically thrown a rock into the or <laughs> thrown a wrench into the entire system, correct? So so let's just say somebody was thinking, you know, gosh, you guys have this scope. I just you just should have just stuck a bigger objective on it. Just just if you would have just yeah, stuck put the, a put bigger the one on, on, it'd be perfect. You guys I, I don't know why you wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't end up so well. Especially <laughs> <laughs> Especially for an objective size. Uh, yeah, because when you, like, let's say you model for a certain size, this is definitely true for what you're saying. You correct for that light. You didn't necessarily model out here unless you plan to make it bigger eventually or something, but you just stick another objective on there. You have all this extra light you're collecting that's not corrected. Who knows what it's going to do? Probably oh. not something good because aberration scales with the size. So Right. Just rogue light. So, yeah. yeah rogue yeah. light. I always heard more light was better. More light, more better. <laughs> not, not if it's rogue. Yeah, I don't want that rogue light. Oh. Um, <laughs> how about how about all the different kind of optics that we have? Um, so Todd, being in development, you, you're working with a number of different kinds of optics. Christian, you understand a number of different kinds of optics. Uh, and and when you break down, like we've got binoculars, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, we've got range finders, like we mentioned before. Um, I mean, red dots, all, the whole gambit. Are they all pretty basically like at their core, kind of the same thing? Or, or when you go from rifle scopes to binoculars, for example, are you making a pretty significant change in how everything needs to function when you're talking about optics? There's some big changes for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know you got some like of the, a prism the and basic, binoculars yep, and stuff like that. It not being mounted on a rifle that helps. I mean, 
we still have to make it rugged because if you drop it or, you know, normal stuff that happens in the field, but, you know, it's not the same as recoil. Mm -hmm. Um, Another big thing is, I guess, just the field of view and, like, the eye relief obviously has to be really short because you're putting your eyes all the way up to a binocular. Okay. Um, The other, unless you have a zooming binocular, they they do exist. Most binoculars are not zooming. That is one nice thing that you don't have to worry about um, having Mm -hmm. to have the mechanics to move lenses. And then also, like, a rifle scope has the adjustment for elevation and windage or just travel in general. And, you know, that's a whole complicated mechanical thing. So you trade off some of those complexities, but binocular has a wider field of view generally, that shorter Mm -hmm. eye relief prisms, and then worrying about how you're going to coat those prisms. And then just in general, which prism you're going to use and designing around it. So you just, you're trading off a couple of complexities, but then the ideas of objective capturing an image, um, kind of the same, and then it getting erected and then eventually getting to your eye. Uh, like those principles are the same. They're kind of doing the same thing. They're both generally telescopes. So yeah, there's what? there's things that complicate your optics too. So like okay. if you go to a handheld rangefinder, now you've got a display. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So you're yeah, kind of putting point. that in your optical path, and that that's different, and you got to deal with that. And then we also have optics, you know, for the the actual laser for the f- finding the range, right? So you got optics to deal with that. So. I think each device kind of has its own challenges depending upon what are those complexities you have in and do they or do they not need to be in the optical path. So Yeah. Yeah. Is something with a display, is that like the hardest thing to get good optics? Uh, I, I don't know if it's, it's hard. It's different, right? You have to treat your optics a little differently, and, and it depends on how you're doing the display. It creates more challenges, I would say. Yeah. Um, but you know, you can deal with those and that's where you start using things like beam splitters and coatings and all that kind of stuff to actually, um, try to minimize the impact on your optical path. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, what's the deal with prisms? Why do binoculars and prism sites <laughs> that use, sounded, use those <laughs> things? That sounded like an intro to like, uh, some sort of like comedy bit. I was thinking yeah. the exact same yeah. thing. Yeah. What's, uh, what's, <laughs> what's the deal, deal with, with pris- those things? Because why don't, uh... I mean, I, I, when I say why don't rifle scopes use them, I mean, obviously, like, we have the Spitfire Prism site, so that is a site that goes on a gun that has a prism in it, but it, it doesn't look like a rifle scope. It's not variable-powered. Um, I guess, yeah, why do rifle scopes not use them, slash why don't binoculars use traditional just lens setups? Where did the prism come into play? Well, a rifle scope doesn't really need it in general because you're, okay. you're erecting the image with the what's called the erector tube. It's a component that's basically part of every rifle scope, and that's the thing that has to move around. Mm-hmm. The prism scope, I mean, it kind of is like what you're saying. It's a rifle scope, but using a prism instead, and that's kind of what you end up with. It's almost like but half a binocular with a reticle. Half a binocular? Uh, and a mount. Yeah, that's yeah. how I'm picturing it. And turrets. So oh, wait, now it's becoming yeah. oh, damn more it. than half a binocular. Well, you said it's kind of more like I a said, I did say weird kind of. binocular. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But the, yeah, and like the erector tube in a rifle scope usually has the zoom lenses in it. Or it's changing the magnification. So is the prism doing the zooming, or is it doing the flipping of the image? Is it doing the for like, the prism site? The prism, you said not I variable either, magnification, right? Yeah. So it's not doing any of the zooming, I guess, because it's not changing. Magnification. But something has to magnify. I'm sorry, that's right. Zooming versus magnifying. Oh, something okay. has to magnify. <laughs> Uh, uh, no, that's my So bad. the yeah, the magnifying would just be kind of the ratio between how the objective captures the image versus how the eyepiece is putting it out, but the prism itself isn't necessarily doing any of that. It's I think I'd have to look at it the specific design, but probably not a powered optic. It's bouncing the light around in a path and coming out, but it's not bending the light like a lens would where it has power to it and it can make an image. Okay. Instead, it's just lengthening the path which is probably why it's also shorter because um, the light can move around in a prism and physically it's in this space, but it's traveling longer than this length mm. as it goes around. So a, a prism kind of allows you to do something with your optical system that you would otherwise have to do with a much physically longer end product? Yeah, that's one of the things you can do with the prism. Okay. Yeah. Shorten the optical path. But cool. you, you also have you know trade-offs with using a prism. Um, every time you have a re- reflection, you're losing light. Is one thing. Got it. They're also not necessarily easy to make, depending on how complicated it is, and you also have to do the coatings and whatever. So, definitely not easy components to to work with. But yeah. there's, I mean, there's advantages for sure. Well, and then too, like when you got binoculars and you have somebody who's got a set that's maybe you know 
five, ten years old, and it's just been in use since the very day it came out of the box. Sometimes those prisms can become out of alignment just after getting bashed around so much. Um, they need to get realigned. Boy, looking through it, I tell you what, anybody who's out there, if you're looking through your binoculars and you think, boy, they just don't look as good as they did when I first got them. I don't know what it is. You should probably send those in because you might be even getting a headache too when you when you look through them. It's, it is it is pretty, uh, pretty amazing what... Uh, what a freshly aligned set of binoculars will do. <laughs> yeah, same thing with, I noticed a lot of my family, when I showed them binoculars, they didn't realize, you know, the independent of Justin of one eye so that they're both in focus at the same time. Oh, right. And they're still like, yeah, these are really good. I'm like, okay, let me adjust this with you, like tell you how to do it. And they're like, okay, now it's really good. <laughs> it's another thing I feel like people is like, they don't really look, It maybe it drifted even if it got loose or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, there's, gosh, there's so much stuff in optics. And How I didn't we, even go through all my application list. Oh my God. We got to do your applications. <laughs> let's, let's talk about all the applications. Okay. Why not? Sport optics I put first just because, you know, that's what we're talking about. But like you said, it kind of is the end of a branch. Um, like I would put just imaging in general or geometrical optics first, and you kind of get to a specific application where you want to use it on a rifle or something or your range finding. Um, imaging and cameras in general is a, a whole field, um, which ties into different things. So one big field is machine vision. Um, that's b- getting bigger and bigger. Um, you, I wonder what the number of cameras made in a year are in the world. It's gotta be a oh lot. My gosh. Billions. I mean, think, billions? think of every phone. Yeah. Every, so mean, every phone, every, phone, um, every, every CCTV. Like. In the same way that he, Todd's talking about spectrometers and, manufacturing using that to qualify their product machine vision can do the same thing but for different qualities or quality metrics so uh, maybe you have like a now a clown nose that's red and it's going and some of them every one in a hundred ends up green and you want to reject it you have a camera and then image processing that says like okay it's green kick it off the line that's a really simple example but um, that translates to basically like all manufacturing in some way probably has. I mean, it's revolutionized the clown nose business, though. I mean, <laughs> it really has. The efficiencies <laughs> yeah. gained are. Yeah, totally. Imaging crept into spectroscopy. I mean, it was, um, yeah. you know, it's just different light. So we had an application where we had a 256 array by 256 array camera. And basically, what you could do is you could take that camera and instead of like if you were looking at a tablet, right, it was a 10 micron spot size. It's pretty small. You can't see much. But if you wanted to see the whole tablet, now at one, one viewing, that whole camera would capture the image of that tablet from a chemical perspective. So you could actually see the coating, and it would actually stitch the images together and then show you, like if you were looking at a certain artifact, like maybe filler is a common thing, right? So like um, cellulose, and you wanted to see that, it could actually show you that, visual image of cellulose just the cellulose and you could see if it was uniform through the tablet or if it wasn't or if it was lacking so you know imaging was a big deal and is becoming more and more a big deal because the cameras are just getting better and and more mass produced so hmm. yep wow yeah there's cameras everywhere there are yep and then along the same lines as cameras have sensors right we already talked about sensors but you can sense any electromagnetic radiation so um, like he was talking about infrared light um, or just like long, long or short wave light that's you don't see it, but you still need a sensor for it. It's so like radar, LIDAR, cars don't necessarily um, work the same way that a typical camera does, but they're sending out a signal and receiving it back on some sort of sensor. Um, communication. So have you heard of fiber optics? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Probably. Okay. Well, yeah, I guess with internet, um, it's kind of like a new thing that's kind of getting laid more and more in the ground, which is um, a way faster way to get data and that's why the internet speeds are so much faster that's an interesting one that works on total internal reflection the fiber is really tiny uh basically light comes in and the it's called the i guess the core is glass and basically it keeps bouncing like all the way through the whole fiber has its glass on the inside um, and then the layer that's outside the glass is what's making it every time it bounces it just stays in the glass if you've ever been in a swimming pool where you're like looking up at the right angle and you can see a reflection from within the swimming pool, mm-hmm. that's also total internal reflection. So all the light is bouncing back in. So that's the principle in which they work, which I think is kind of cool. So that um, was, I mean, geez. And then what they do is, uh, 
I don't work in communications, obviously, but you can uh, do a multiplex, which is taking different wavelengths of information or different packets of information, putting them in together and sending it down the fiber. And then on the other side, the demultiplexer spreads it back out and you get all that separated information out. And it's similar to like um, electrical signals, like you're sending, it's weird to think about how you correlate that information into what your internet's actually displaying at the end. Like it's incredible right. that all these things that have to happen, but. Pictures, um, words, colors, video, the fact that all of that that we can understand is somehow being translated via stuff that, I mean, if I just looked at yeah, that, I wouldn't see anything of it. Yeah. It means nothing. Yeah, and I mean, Fiber optics use light, so it travels fast, right? This That's is it. funny. I brought this. I didn't know if I'd use it, but you... you. So we used the two. <laughs> That's fiber optic. Oh, look at That's that. That's actually a probe, right? So, you know, this allows you to take the light, infrared light, and put it anywhere. So this was a bundle of 10 fiber optics, which took the infrared energy out. And then there were 10 fiber optic bundles around it, which collected it back in. So for quality control, like, you know, if you bring in a huge vat of like a solvent and it comes in a railroad car, you want to know if it's good or not before you put it in your product. Okay. So a fiber optic would let you kind of do that or, or a container of powder or, you know, active ingredient. And then you could use fiber optics, you know, to go from the lab more to like at line online, where if you're actually making something where you're putting different compounds together, you can use fiber optics to actually monitor that. And what's nice about fiber optics is, they go out, and if the end of them get broken, you can actually, you know, cut them, put them back in, and keep using them. So, hmm. but it's it's funny how it all relates, right? It just shows you how the electromagnetic spectrum can be utilized in different areas in different ways using the same optical techniques. Yep, and that fiber. Is wild. So the what you'd call fiber is it's just another type of waveguide. So getting light from one place to another, yeah, it's a simple way. But yeah, you're using okay. the physical optics, the wave physics. And how it actually stays in the fiber. You realize you realize more and more. I mean, somebody's a firearms enthusiast, they think optics, you know, or a hunter, they think optics, they think of the stuff like like Vortex has, you know, in cells and stuff. And but you realize that that really is kind of a small niche, pretty small niche yeah. within all of optics. I mean, I still have engineering friends that tell industry. me like, "Oh, you just make eyeglasses just to mess with me." <laughs> 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 I, eyeglasses are important too. That's its own field. Yeah. It's funny though. Like uh, when I, very important. But when I, you know, you talk to people, you meet people that maybe are like less familiar with like you know the sports optics world, and you're like, oh, I work for Vortex Optics. They're like, oh, like like eyeglasses, and microscopes. Yeah, yeah micro and like yeah. No, no, the cool stuff. Um, <laughs> exactly. the stuff you can put I, on the gun. I've got exactly. <laughs> Let me show you. Um, fiber optics. How similar? Like the ones that you're talking about there how similar or different or do you know like when i think of uh, how i use fiber optics well i guess i use it with the internet but like a bow sight or maybe like a fiber optic bead on your shotgun is that like just a piece of what's in that cable or same different i think it depends on probably the product um, it might be one of those things like hologram is used in a way where sometimes it's accurate and sometimes it's not so if mm -hmm. they they could have actually a fiber that's guiding the light from a source and it's going to efficiently get to your eye or be bright. Um, so yeah, it'd be similar. Is Unless just, there's sometimes I mean, there's fake, fake fiber optic. Fake yeah. Fiber. I think you could probably get a way to make it look like it. And I'm not really sure. Well, you I'm can, not, you I don't can, know as much about both sites. You, you can coat glass to make it look like it's illuminated all the time. I mean, yeah, there's different yep. ways. So it oh. could be a fiber could not it depends on a, a fiber would be if you're illuminating it somehow. Right. So you can, okay. Yeah. Which would then be in that case by ambient light, if you're talking about on like a bow site or something, right? It, it would have to be. Yeah. Or an external source. You could use like a laser to illuminate it or something. Okay. Yeah. Like yeah. I know a lot of bow. I'm totally maybe I'm sidetracking, but uh, like it's like uh, like a fluorescent type coil that eventually gets you know sent out to like a singular point, which would be like yeah. your point yeah. of aim. And then some of them do have an external light that you know adds a little extra gas to the illumination if you need it. it. But yeah. you know what works real slick, Mark? They call it a fiber optic. You know what works real slick? Trad bows. <laughs> hey, I'm not uh, I'm not entirely against it, Jim. That's right. That's right. Uh the question that I wonder is I guess well and, and plus I just made the, the the observation that sport optics are really such a small niche within all of optics. 
And so this question, when I originally like wrote it up or thought of it to ask you guys, was more related to, to sport optics. But optics have been getting better and better. I mean, obviously, like we said, we have all this computing power, and it's the optical industry has exploded since then. Um, it's always been, uh, it's always had a great deal of intrigue by many scientists over the years. And they just keep getting better and better and better. And every single year we come out with, you know, like a XYZ rifle scope or binocular or something, or there's something that, that's come out with that's better than the last one. Like, are we ever, are we, are we ever going to reach a point where we just can't get any better? Like you just can't make an optic any better? Or is that physically impossible to achieve? I'm sure via some physical limitation like manufacturing tolerance and stuff like that, I suppose that could that could limit us. But like I mean, are our are our increases in optics only gonna start getting just kind of like smaller and smaller and smaller? We're gonna have to find other areas to improve or, or is the sky the limit? Uh there's definitely still more room to improve. I mean there's a theoretical physics limit. Um, to your point that you just can't get better than that would be the diffraction I talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, so at some point you're limited by diffraction, but I think there's still room to improve, but it is more incremental. Like the more you squeeze out, you kind of get diminishing returns, but on all sides, manufacturing the design itself, um, like the mechanical design. And then you, you do start looking at other places to add value to the customer in whatever way we want to make people the best they can be however that shakes out. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a theoretical limit. I don't know how close we are yet because, I mean, at the very least, maybe the quality stays the same, but you could make the thing more accessible because the manufacturing methods are getting better. Um, There's things like that too. So, yeah, I wish I could tell the future. It could (laughs) make things really easy, but yeah, like you kind of have uh, to. He'd be a consultant. It's the kind of stuff that keeps you up. (laughs) It's like the kind of stuff that keeps you up at night. I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I guess yeah. I think, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll go back to my car industry or whatever, right? I mean, back in the 70s, I think, somewhere around there, Chevy was making a car you could buy from the factory with 700 and some odd horsepower, and now Dodge makes a big deal about it when they sell a Hellcat with 707. It's like, somebody's been doing that for a long time. I think the thing is, is that when you buy the 2021 Hellcat, it's probably going to last longer than the 70s Chevy Camaro. I think it was the ZL1 or something like that. It's probably yeah. going to last longer. It might be a little bit more comfortable. It's got a touchscreen in the middle, and it's got airbags, and it's got whatever, come more comfortable seats. And so I feel like, you know, with them, they started realizing, like, okay, we can't, we just can't start selling cars that have, like, 1,500 horsepower from the factory. Like, we got to start making these things nicer in other ways or something like that, uh, more efficient, whatever. Um, but that was what I was wondering is like, just where that, where we, where we are, so to speak. Yeah. And there's always the like shorter, lighter, more durable. Like it's, it's funny. You look at like camping equipment. That's one where it's like, it's so easy to see the trade-offs of like more lightweight. It's going to be less durable because you use less things. Um, like to a certain point you get like ultra lightweight, you're trading something off and it might be worth it. And optics, it's weirder because, Like the solution is so complicated with so many variables, but you can only get so short and light and whatever. It's like, how light do you really want it? Where it's just, I mean, it could just be like a 2D. That would be like how you want it, right? (laughs) Because you live in 2D. Live life 2D. (laughs) Simple. No Z It's a simple simple way of life. Jim, this this one note that I had on this piece of paper (laughs) that I brought, because I was going to recycle this piece. This is 2.6. That's actually the weight of a uh, cook pot that I was looking at today. It's (laughs) 2.6 (laughs) ounces. You might be giving up something to get a cook pot that's only 2.6 ounces. I need to reevaluate. Maybe put it in 3D. I I think the... A big area in optics growth, which we haven't, we don't know, is when it's applied to other technologies, like applying optics to imaging. Yeah. Right. Um, that's, I think, where the biggest growth comes. And there's just, you know, technologies that we don't know about yet. So, yeah. I think there's always that capability where, you know, as things get smaller and more powerful and more lightweight, I think that's where the growth comes and the changes come. And I don't know what some of those are yet. So, yeah. yeah. Somebody applied optics to internet. And it made internet faster. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just that's wild. It's wild. It is wild. And there's still a million more applications. I don't know if I should go through them all. It's a carry on. We we can I'm go curious. through a part we'll, two. We'll do a we'll do like a <laughs> list off a few of your highlight ones on there. All right, I can. One of my favorite ones, even though it's annoying to do if you're the person doing it, is optical metrology. Um, oh. So that goes back to 
interference is probably the biggest thing. But basically, you get to measure things. You don't have to contact it, and you get to measure things on the order of the wavelength of light, which is nanometers. So as an interesting thing is the quality of lenses is down in kind of like the nanometer range um, around there. So like you look at uh, the quality of a lens when they manufacture it, how well is it polished to its original design? They have to use interference and uh, optical metrology to actually measure it. But it's not just optics that get measured that way. Um, like you could do CNC metal machining mm-hmm. and you'll have to measure it that way or just like a metal mirror, like in the spectrometers that are probably being produced now, you know, they need to do have cutting edge uh, to get more accuracy and precision. So they're going to have to measure each metal component that way. Hmm. Um, but yeah, the, actually I'll draw another draw out session. Um, this is a very engineered thing to do. It Every is. Every time I talk mm. to an engineer, they they always have to have like a notepad nearby <laughs> so you got to draw something. <laughs> I'm too visual of a person to to not be able to do it. This is like a really simple example. So like, let's just say this was supposed to be flat and you got this divot here. Well, light that comes in here okay. travels like, let's say if this is your where you're measuring it, travels that distance and light that came here travels this extra distance times two because it goes in and out. And depending on what this distances um, gives you more, I guess, what they call fringes or an interference pattern, which um, that I won't draw out, but I guess I will. It looks like there's a dark. (laughs) On second thought. (laughs) I have to. I have to. But it's dark like light, and those are called fringes. And you can count the number of fringes, and based on how many there is, is how much it's deviating. It's like a really simplified conceptual thing, but... um, so you can measure like really, really small deviations doing that, which is mm-hmm. just kind of interesting. Um, I know that uh, like our machine shop, we've got a metrology lab and they use yeah. some of this stuff and, and yeah, they you can find, stuff. I mean, you can find little inconsistencies or see if something's within tolerance by, by microns Yeah, just, just by using light, I guess. Yeah. That's and some of the stuff they do, so they'll use the CMM contact measurement. So they'll have the probe. And that is really accurate, but like the typical machined part will be uh, just aluminum and it's not going to be polished. It's not like an optical surface. So for this to work in general, uh, you need the polished or optical surface. You have to get the light back. If you have this rough aluminum part, the light's going to come in and just scatter all over the place. Okay. Um, that'd be like the surface roughness. There's actually still ways to measure that optically. Um, like you can measure roughness of a surface with a white light interferometer. Um, there's a bunch of different types of optical metrology to measure all sorts of things. Um, but yeah, so like it's, it's generally better to do a CMM, I think for machine parts. So a way that we did it is, uh, you know, silicon wafers that you grow ICs on, right? Silicon wafer is how you manufacture No, I don't know, Todd. Yeah, sorry, Todd. (laughs) Oh, so, so at, at the base of a, when you make a chip. That goes on a computer, right? The, oh, way, yeah, that, the okay. way they make that is it's a it's a silicon disc, and they deposit different dopants on the disc, and one disc may contain a couple hundred chips. So they grow these silicon wafers, and then they deposit the different dopants on it, and then they usually make, like now I think it's 300 millimeter wafers is what they use, but that's how your basic ICs are made, right? And then they're just cut up, and then they're populated on computer boards so like i'll take your pen what christian was showing there we did a different thing so on a 300 millimeter wafer what you do is you have a wafer and it's pretty thin and then what you do is you deposit dopants on it and different dopants that you deposit on it have different electrical properties and that's how they make the gates what is a dopant yeah what is that so either it'll it'll allow electricity to go through it or it won't oh right so by by depositing different things you can create circuits very basically right so what we would do is if if you instead of doing spectroscopy, what we did is we shine the interferogram through, and what would happen is you'd get one that would bounce off, one that would go through the dopant, and one that would go straight through, and you would get an interferogram here, and you would get an interferogram here, and simply you could measure those two to determine this thickness. Hmm. So it's important because by if you're talking about 300 millimeter wafer, you could have several hundred ICs populated on that. So part of what's important is to measure that 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 the wafer's pure, but also that the thickness of the dopants are correct. Because if they aren't, right, you can get shorts and things like that. So um, you need to know how thick that is being deposited, and they're usually spun, you know, spun on the wafer. So having variation, you know, you don't want to have a surface that's 
like this, right? You want to make yeah. sure. So, you know, you, you measure probably 3,000 points on a 300 millimeter wafer based on a robotic arm that kind of moves it consistently and then shines the light through. And that's exactly what he was describing is that that's the way we applied it in infrared. Yep. And you're, you're basically, basically measuring destructive interference. Wow. Oops, really well, that included like machine vision, robotics, yeah. interference. That's, I mean, it's, and that's like one very specific thing. And, but to, to work all that together is crazy. Yeah. I don't even know. It's so hard to top that one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, I'll just quickly I go through a couple of ones. No, it's okay. <laughs> the, uh, so like lighting and illumination, we don't think about like bulbs and stuff and how, right. I mean, those might not necessarily be as complicated designs depending on what the room looks like, but, um, headlights for cars is a big illumination yeah. uh, design field. So that's kind of interesting. Very, very, uh, much more advanced than people would think. Yeah. Like when you think about all the mirrors and stuff that people use or the reflective surfaces and lights and how they're angled, like the LEDs and yep. uh, that's pretty wild. Oh, there's definitely a durability component there too. Like, you know, you oh, bump yeah. your light bulb, you're like, well, I need another one. <laughs> yep. It's crazy. Uh, they also have really strict government regulations on how yeah. much light is where in the field because you don't want to blind everyone with your super bright light. So it can be really bright here, but it can't, it, like across the road, you don't want it to be bright. So they have to do all that are designed and make sure it's like within these very, very specific parameters. Yeah, except what they did was they made it so that if somebody's coming up over a hill in front of you, then they have their lights on. You get blinded as soon as they come over the hill because yeah. the lights have to point more downward, you know, to supposedly yeah. keep out of people's eyes. <laughs> but then there's always a way that yeah. it will I, That's you. what I think about because someone behind me too, they go over the bump I just went over and it's like flashes right into my eyes. Like, yeah, and then you're like, what did I do wrong? I just flashed the right <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm like, oh, I guess there was a bump, but... Yeah. I guess there's no more on the list that I would go. I mean, well, there's, there's a million things. There's a million things. We kind of cover it, some of them. That's what I think is just, like I said, it's one of the interesting things that was worth kind of, I think, getting out of this podcast. The fact that optics are, I mean, like they're everywhere. And yeah. whether, again, whether you realize it or not, you, you can't get away from optics. And uh, it's just, it's so cool. It's cool getting to be part of this industry and, um, you know, like I said, even though, even though we do find ourselves in more of a small niche of it, um, it's, uh, it's just a unique facet. I'm sure there's people out there who are thinking to themselves, like they're working on laser, like, can you believe some people use light to put on, you know, in a scope and, or, <laughs> yeah. you know, and then use it on top of a gun and shoot a thousand yards away plus whatever. And, uh, you know, that's all sweet stuff. I mean, it is. And just thinking of the, hearing you guys talk about it, it's, it's all the science, like, Physics, yeah. chemistry, you know. And in school, too, at the time, I'm like, why am I taking chemistry? Why am I taking circuits? And then, like, now looking back, it's like, I'm really glad I took those so I have some basic background. And even I didn't realize till today until I was thinking about making this list together, like chemistry learning. I don't know how much chemistry you took, but, like, electrons in atoms and that model and, like, different energy levels for electrons and how much that made me actually understand the optics behind it, or, hmm. or the the optics from it, um, and I didn't even realize that till till today. And it was like you said, it's really cool to see how everything connects together. But yeah, it's crazy. It's wild. Well, sweet stuff, guys. Thanks. We, uh, you know, like we said, for those of you listening out there, you got to peer into the minds of some guys here that are very heavily involved in the optical side of things. Have been for many years. And, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I'd say uh, let us know in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube or hit us up on Instagram. Now, mind you, of course, when we talk to optical engineers and we are in the industry of, of what we do here, we work for Vortex, there's some stuff that we can't go into. And, and usually even you, we may have to dance around that in a, in a podcast like this at times. But um, we definitely want to try and, uh, I don't know, entertain people, inform people as much as we possibly can. So, um, yes. Without further ado, though, yeah, let us know those things, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. See you on the next one. All right. Yeah, see you guys. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Thanks. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below, and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. 
We'd love to hear from you over there and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.